I want to, as Pastor said, uh, I'm not finished with this prayer series uh, because the thrust of this series is talking about all different aspects of prayer. Uh, I want to talk to you about upgrading, enhancing, and discovering. Upgrading and enhancing and discovering new ways, new avenues, new techniques, even devices that can put the fire back on the altar of your prayer life. You say, what kind of devices? Well, you can have an app now that, that will help you pray for the nations of the world. The Voice of the Martyrs app. Today, pray for Indochina or pray for, well, that's a region really, uh, uh, and it gives you the population. And, and do you believe that a million prayers going up for uh, that area could make a difference? Of course it can. So even devices, but prayer has got to just stop being just a, uh, oh God, my name is Jimmy and here I am and I need you to give me. You know, we got to have more than uh, just just one same prayer prayed every day over and over again. Now, there's nothing wrong with saying the same prayer over and over every day again, as long as you got the life in it. And so I want to talk to you about those ways uh, of praying, upgrading, enhancing, discovering the kaleidoscope of prayer. Early African converts had a separate spot in the thicket where they would pour out their heart to prayer unto God. They prayed so much that they wore paths to the spot where they prayed. And if somebody began to be negligent in prayer, um, others would kindly remind them, my brother, the grass grows on your path. I don't want the grass to grow on your prayer path. I want prayer for you to be all that it should be, exhilarating, exciting, excelling. Someone said, if we want to be much for God, we must be much with God. And that comes by fire on the altar in prayer. And just by way of reminder, as Peter says, to stir up your minds by remembrance, I talked to you about keeping a prayer journal. Have you been doing that? Some of you can do it in your mind. You have photographic memories. But if others of us, have you been writing down and dating and logging? Uh, I know that I'll have to go back in my prayer journal, but I, I know I marked it in my Bible about two years ago when the Lord said, a house is coming. A house is coming. And I didn't know how soon, and I didn't know when, and I didn't know where, but the Lord has fulfilled that in mine and Darnell's life. Um, and I talked to you about the seven prayer points. I talked to you about praying every day to avoid sin. Praying every day, keep a watch over your mouth. Be careful what you say. Praying every day for your loved ones to be saved. Praying every day for leaders. Praying for wisdom and guidance every day. Every day pray to be a blessing. Every day pray in the Spirit and with the Spirit. I talked about the two-way conversation. I, and I may visit that again before I finish. But where there's a place in the Bible where David prayed 300 words. And God spoke back 300 words. Prayer is a two-way conversation. Listening to God. Uh, there was a place in the New Testament where, where uh, they were on the Mount of Transfiguration. And uh, Peter said... Uh, why don't we build some altars? And that's a good thing. Uh, but God thundered back and said, this is my beloved son. Hear him. He didn't say, this is my beloved son. Talk to him. He said, this is my beloved son. Hear him. Yes, we should talk to him. But there's some things he wants to talk back to us. And uh, I can tell you that just in the last 48 hours, the Lord has spoken to me on something very important and has given me some direction. And I know he has spoken to me. And I love the fact that I have a relationship with God. And there, this is not weirdo stuff. This is not hearing voices. Some of you are hearing voices. But no, I'm talking about that, that, uh, that you know that there's a way to tell and discern when it's just a thought or when it's a word from the Lord. Because he wants to speak to you. You're his children. Amen, somebody. So tonight... I want to take a different aspect of prayer. I want to go from the internal to the external, from the substance of our prayers to the situation of our prayers, from what we pray to how we pray what we pray. And I want to talk to you tonight about the postures that enhance prayers. Postures. You know, posture is very important. They teach children to sit up straight. Uh, how you posture yourself on a daily basis affects some of your lifestyle and some of your health issues. And so I want to talk to you about postures 
that enhance your prayer life. Look at 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 42. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 42, the kaleidoscope of prayer, number nine, postures that enhance your prayers. If you're there, say amen. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went to the top of Carmel. He cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. Father, tonight, help us to understand and maybe think about and maybe in a fresh way the posture of our prayers. And as Elijah put his head between his knees and postured himself, God, you did amazing things. And it's not really the posture that brings the power. It's the sincerity behind the posture. And Father, tonight, enhance our prayer life. Teach us to pray and teach us how to pray. Both go hand in hand, and we'll give you the praise for it. And everybody said amen and amen. Now, remember, let me just tell you the backdrop of this story. The nation of Israel, the northern kingdoms, were in deep rebellion, deep sin. King Ahab, Queen Jezebel, and God brings a famine to the land. And for three years, there has been no rain in the sky. The land is suffering. Cattle are dying. People are dying. Some are even eating their own family members and children. And God has provided for Elisha, but it was the time for rain. It was a time for an outpouring. And it was desperate times. It was dry times. It was demonic times. Does it sound like the kind of world we live in tonight? And so Elijah begins to understand that God is ready to send rain on this parched land. He's ready to send rain even in a wicked king's reign, R-E-I-G-N. I really tell you that even though so-and-so is in the White House, God wants to pour out floods of water upon his church and upon this world. And it's significant to me that Elijah, he didn't just say, Lord, would you just send us rain? Well, he didn't just say it in a throat. He got on his, he got his face between his knees, almost in a fetal position. He got in a posture, and I'm not saying that posture made a difference in the prayer, but the prayer made a difference in his posture because it affected the way he prayed. And there are ways that we can pray that we posture ourselves physically that can mirror what God is doing spiritually, and it can add uh, a different aspect to our praying uh, and will make prayer become more alive and more effective. Uh, again, it's not the posture itself, uh, but it's the prayers behind that uh, and, the, and the way that we posture ourselves at times uh, that will enhance uh, what God is doing uh, in our lives. The Bible says that Moses stood before the Lord uh, on the mount. Uh, Jesus said in Mark chapter 11 and verse 25, Mark chapter 11 uh, verse 25 says, and when ye stand praying, he didn't say when you kneel praying or when you talk praying, but when you stand praying, forgive. So there is one of the postures that I'm going to get into in just a few moments tonight. But let me talk to you about several different postures that can enhance your prayer life. One of them is, point number one, is bowing down. Somebody say bowing down. Oh, come, Psalms 95 and verse 6. Psalm 95 and verse 6 says, oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Now, we talk about bowing our heads. We talk about that being part of praying, you know, at the dinner table. Let us bow our heads in prayer. If we're in church service, let us, let us bow our heads. Why do we do that? Why do we bow our heads? Why, 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 do, why not look up? Why not do that? There's nothing wrong with looking up. I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. But sometimes bowing our head is a sign of our attitude of worship. Bowing is an act of lowering the head or sometimes the entire body. Sometimes when I'm praying, I'm just bowing before the Lord while I'm standing up because he is my king. He is my sovereign. Can you say amen? 
Um, it's a social gesture. It exists now and has existed in various cultures at various periods in history. Different cultures have placed varying degrees of importance on bowing and have used bowing in a variety of ways. In European cultures, bowing is an exclusively male practice. Females perform a related gesture called a curtsy, uh, as in Japan, the depth of the bow expresses the degree or of respect or gratitude. So if you just kind of give a nod, that's one thing, a sort of bowing. But if you really do it and extend it, then you're giving even greater reverence. And so when we pray, bow your heads, close your eyes. We say that, don't we? And God hears those prayers when we bow. Uh, it's, again, the bowing doesn't bring power, but it does speak of our heart and of our reverence to the Lord. And so if you're just sitting on your couch uh, and somebody has a need, uh, just you can just bow your head and say, oh, God, help them. And I promise you when, he, when you pray and when you show that reverence to God and when you honor him in bowing, uh, he will show up and he will show off. Uh, he is the Lord. Can you say amen? Let us bow. And pray. Let us bow down, the psalmist said. Number two, not only is bowing down a posture that enhances your prayer life, but this goes even further. There's a thing called kneeling. Kneeling. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 36, it says that, uh, if you'll just pull that up, and when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. Now, I would do a, a, a kneel down here, but getting down is not the problem. Getting up in front of an audience is probably not what I recommend uh, public speakers do, okay? But you get the point, kneeling before the Lord. You know, I just found out that, uh, that the Dallas Mavericks are not going to play the national anthem anymore. Dallas, Dallas, Texas, um, basketball team. They're not going to play the national anthem anymore because of all the controversy about kneeling at the anthem. Well, I did find out that the NBA, National Basketball Association, made it and said, oh, yes, you are. We're going to play the national anthem in all of our games. So that's, that's good. They realize they've lost so many millions of viewers that they decided that we need to, we need to show respect uh, to the American flag. Amen. The United States of America. People say, well, that's not spiritual. Of course it's spiritual. Uh, God, read the book, read the Bible. And uh, God, uh, when righteous and authority, things, things happen. God is concerned about the nations of the earth and the people. And he has blessed and favored our nation. And, and, uh, and so we, we understand kneeling that when, when a person uh, is, is kneeling when they should be standing, that's a form of disrespect. Amen. But on the flip side, when we kneel before God, we are showing that he is our sovereign. He is our king. And there are times in our life when we just need to get on our knees. We need a little neology. Amen. And uh, now some of you can't. Some of you have physical ailments or maybe you have arthritis and you can't get on your knees. But every now and then, kneeling down before the Lord physically on your knees uh, uh, proclaims that he is the Lord. The devil sees it. Sometimes family sees it. But it makes a difference at times when we kneel before God. I'm going to share something personal. And I don't like to share it share this because I'm not trying to make me look good. This is just something to amplify a milestone in my life. So uh, the bishop asked me to be the North Carolina Conference Archives Director back last fall. And um, so that position allows me to be the steward of the history of the North Carolina Conference. That is an amazing thing and an awesome task to do. And I am very uh, honored to do that. And I count it as a spiritual job. And so I have an office in Falcon at headquarters, an office, North Carolina Conference Archive Director, Reverend Ricky Nelms. And so my first day, and that's not a full-time job. I don't, I'm not down there every day, but it's, I, I coordinate it with other helpers. So it's not like a big position where I'm paid a big salary. Oh, I wish. Glory to God. Amen. That would be great. And uh, maybe if the Lord blesses the conference even more, you know, uh, we, they might could bring me on full-time. Uh, certainly would take, be nice to have a full-time archivist. It doesn't matter if I'm full-time or, or half the time or some of the time. 
that's a position that the Lord has given me with an office. And so here's what I did. On the first day, October 1st, when I began, at 9 o'clock, I drove down there at 9 a.m., and the first hour in that office, I spent on my knees, literally. I didn't have to, but I wanted it as a symbolic way for the first hour. I didn't take a phone call. I didn't run a photocopier. I didn't, uh, I didn't try to do planning. I didn't, I didn't do anything, but I wanted the first hour on the first day of that spiritual job. And the next time the Lord allows me to be a lead pastor, uh, which I believe will be in the future. I don't know when or how he's called me to that ministry. If he opens that door, uh, the first hour of my first day, I'm going to spend on my knees symbolically in prayer. Why? Because I'm wanting in my spirit, there's just something about doing it physically to kind of force to the force in my thinking and to show to God that Lord, I, you're in charge. You are my king. The Bible says every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. And it is not by strength or human wisdom alone. I have to, if, I, if I'm going to be a success at pastoring, if I'm going to be a success at parenting, if I'm going to be a success uh, as archives director or Sunday school teacher or whatever, I want to get on my knees and say, God, it's all about you. I need you. And if you and if you and if God blesses you with something and he gives you a promotion or maybe you get a new position in the church, there's a reason you're there. It wouldn't hurt just to get on your knees for five minutes and say, Lord, as an act of my obedience to you and humility before you, knowing that I need you and I can't succeed without you on your knees with your hands lifted up. I promise you the Lord will see and the Lord will hear and the Lord will bless. Can you say amen to tonight. Now, please don't look at me as like some great spiritual person, but I'm just telling you, I intended my first hour to be on my knees before the Lord in that new ministry. Amen. That's a posture of prayer, kneeling, kneeling beside the bed, kneeling with somebody who's in the bed, maybe on the couch, and you just kneel down beside them at the altar, kneeling down. I know, I know sometimes, uh, a lot of times it's better for them to stand up because you can talk to them that way. But kneeling is a posture of prayer, bowing is a posture of prayer. Number three, here's something with intensity. Number three, you read this over and over in the scripture falling on the face, falling on the face. Look at Matthew chapter 26 and verse 39. Matthew 26 and verse 39. And he went, talking about Jesus, a little farther, and he fell on his face. He fell on his face and prayed. Now, I love this passage of Scripture. This is Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane at the defining moment, the reason he came to earth, about to be crucified. And the Bible says he fell on his face before God. That speaks of intensity. That speaks of, I got to have an answer now. That speaks of face. Somebody say the word face. We're talking about FaceTime with the Almighty. Oh, I, I just, you know, the Bible says, seek his face. Amen. And, and as Tommy Tenney pointed out in the God Chasers many years ago, we seek his hand, but we need to seek his face. Hallelujah, somebody. And, uh, and I like what it says. If we go back to that passage of Scripture, Sister Darnell. It says that he went a little farther. And that's the key to victory. Sometimes we stop way too short. Sometimes we just give up too soon. But we need to go farther in our prayers. We need to bow at times. We need to kneel at times. We don't need to do the same prayer, the same thing every day if it loses its power. Now, if it still has its power, the same thing every day is fine. Please understand my heart. Uh, every now and then, we got to go a little further in our prayer. We got to pray a little longer than we normally do. We got to pray, pray more for the same three things that we pray every day. We got to go farther in fasting, farther in prayer, farther in the anointing. Uh, this world is going way out for their stuff. Uh, it's time for the church to go a little farther. Amen. Uh, it's the, the Lord is soon the return. It's time for us to get serious about serving God with all of our hearts and winning souls. Amen. He fell on his face. Go to Genesis chapter 17, and you'll see something very interesting there. And Sister Darnell, I don't think I have that. 
in the notes there if you if you want to go. So I'm going to turn over here in Brother Bird's Bible. He's Genesis chapter 17. Uh-oh. Oh, here it is. I thought the page was missing. That's an old Bible. Genesis chapter 17 and verse 1. If you're there, say amen. When Abraham was 90 years old. Somebody say 90. Now, I don't care. I know it's a different world back then. and People live longer. But 90 is still 90. Tell somebody next to you, God ain't finished with you yet. I, did I, 90 and what? Nine. <laughs> I was just going to stop at 90. 99. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the what? Almighty God, walk before me. Be thou perfect or mature or sincere. And I will make my covenant between me and thee. And I will multiply thee exceedingly. And look at verse 3. And what did Abram do? Abram fell on his face. And God talked with him. I love that. He fell on his face. And that's a posture of prayer. Now, point Three and point four are closely tied. Go ahead and put up point four because one of the postures of prayer is lying down or laying before the Lord. But I, I want you to see these two kind of as one and the same, although I have them differently. But go back to uh, point three, Sister Darnell, uh, because I want you to know that falling on the face uh, is, a, is a scripture you'll see throughout the scriptures. It means uh, that you are prostrate before the Lord. God is talking to you. You're talking to God. Uh, and every now and then we just have to fall on our face. It could be in a hospital room. It could be we just put our hand, uh, our face in our hands. Uh, we could do it on the floor. But when we're talking about falling on the face, we're talking about getting to business with God and God getting to business with us. Amen. Now look at verse 17 of Genesis 17. Uh, um, it says, uh, or go to verse 15, Genesis 17 and verse 15. And God said, if you're there, say amen. See if your neighbor's got it. Genesis 17 and verse 15. And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai, thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her and give thee a son of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Stop right there. I'm talking about a woman who's 89 years old. Now, I don't care again what the Scripture makes it plain. She was past childbearing year. She was beyond the middle age of a woman's life. Reproduction was over. The body had shut down. She was post-menopausal is what the uh, medical term today. So she has beyond the ability to have a child, uh, but not beyond the ability of God to give her a child. Amen. There are no impossibilities. And what, did, what does the next scripture say in Genesis 17, 17? That when he heard that his 89-year-old woman was going to have a child and have many children, kings shall come of her. Then Abram, what? Abraham fell upon his face and what? And laughed and said in his heart, shall a child be born unto him that is 100 years old, and shall Sarah that is 90 years old bear? Oh, my friend, sometimes we just got to have face time. Sometimes God just does things that are blows our mind. Sometimes we just got to get before the Lord. Sometimes we got to pray those drug addicts in. Amen. Sometimes when the church is dead and cold, we just got to get on our face and say, can an old dead church still have souls saved and lives changed? Yes, it can. I'm glad that don't apply to Westmoreland, but there are some out there and some pastors that need to get on their face before God and pray until something happens. God is still in the miracle working business. Uh, this is more than lay me down to sleep prayer. This is falling on my face. Uh, this is a posture of desperation, of inspiration, uh, a business with God and thank the Lord that I can go directly to his face. You know, on your Apple iPhone, you have an app called FaceTime. Okay, I know you're mostly seniors in here. You don't understand that. But there's a way. <laughs> I was just having fun with you. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. You're technophobic over here. <laughs> and uh, But you have a way on your phone. Your grandkids got it. Might as well get on up with it. 
but you can hold that phone and you can see somebody's face. Amen. Oh, we need some face time with the Almighty. Falling on our face. Uh, Revelation chapter 7. Go there. Revelation chapter 7, 11 and 12. This is a posture of prayer. Now, we've talked about Abraham in the Old Testament. And I thought it was very interesting in the uh, New Testament. Revelation chapter 7. And this, I'm just going to have to pull it up in this Bible here. Revelation 7, verse 11. If you're there, say amen. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces Woo! and worshiped God. Now just stop right there. They're in the presence of God every day. They see him night and day. There's no night up there. That's our terminology. But for this moment, they take a different posture. That's the point I'm trying to make. Every now and then, we need to take a different posture and pray, sometimes with our head bowed, sometimes kneeling physically, sometimes falling on our faces, saying in verse, verse 12, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power, being our God forever and forever. And one of the elders answered and said unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which have come out of great tribulation. Oh, somebody give him praise here tonight. And then go to Isaiah chapter 38, verse 2. I do have that up in the regular notes tonight. Laying down. There are times in prayer meeting, people have laid on the altar. Now, do you, now, now I used to, when I was young, I didn't worry about it. But it, as I've gotten older, into more in the middle aged, I'm more concerned about, you know, viruses, sicknesses. And, and now with this pandemic, everybody's thinking that way. But it's not that I'm germophobic. I'm not germophobic. Uh, people think that or might, might say that. But I am conscious that on this floor is where people's shoes are walking. People's shoes that have gone into the restroom and gone out into the yard where, where animals have been there. And, and so I know that we carpet the floor. I mean, it's carpet. I know that we uh, uh, vacuum the floor. And I know it's clean as far as you don't see dirt. But I'm telling you, in my mind, that the floor is not sanitary. All right? Not 100%. Okay? But let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I will not hesitate to lay on that floor, put my nose right in that dirty carpet and all the germs that are there. If I have an encounter with God, I don't care. Hallelujah, somebody. Amen. Uh, sometimes we got to get our pride out. Sometimes we got to mess up our hair a little bit. I remember one time we had a, a revival with Paul Jackson. This is when I was pastoring here when it was Living Waters during my eight years here, and I was young back then, and buddy, I had a head thick full of brown hair, and uh, and I had every piece in place, and uh, and I remember somebody, I believe it was Judy Deans, came up here and prayed for me and messed up my hair. And when I got to shouting and praising God, I didn't care about my hair, and when the church saw that I didn't care about my hair, they got excited about it. Y'all probably forgot about that. That was one of those summer revivals we had. Falling on our face. Laying before God. Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall. Where is he at? He's in bed. He's sick. He's got a cancerous boil or something that's eating him. And he has days to live. And, and the prophet came and said, get your house in order. You're about to die. And by the way, that's not such a bad thing. You know, death is a is 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 a, is, is a, a a promotion for us. Death is uh, we need to quit fearing death. Uh, I know we want to be on Earth, and I know we don't want to leave our loved ones. And I'm certainly not saying that. Boy, I'm excited. I want to die right this minute. I'm just telling you, though, at the end of the day, that that when we get a, a earthly death sentence, uh, 
And we have time to get ourselves order and time to get our family and say, hey, I'm going to be with the Lord and you need to be saved. I, I, it's not a bad thing if you know the Lord because one glimpse of his face, uh, as the pastor said, he saw the glory. Folks, this is not a, bad, this is not a terrible, terrible thing. Uh, death to the Christian is a release uh, to be forever in the presence of God. Oh, glory. Church 24-7. Forever. Amen. But now Hezekiah won't ready to die. <laughs> and I believe we ought to pray like Hezekiah. Lord, he, he turned his face. He, lay, he was laying down and laid before the Lord and said, Oh, God, I've served you and I've stood for you. And, and I'm asking you to, to reverse that curse. And you know the story. And, and, and this is very, very funny, very interesting because it says why Isaiah was out in the gate, leaving, God told him to turn around and go back and tell him, I've heard your prayer. <laughs> Somebody say amen. I've heard your prayer, and I'm going to give you 15 more years. Somebody needs to know that tonight, that God's adding life years to your life. Amen. I am so glad to know that he extends life. When his purpose is finished, he'll take us on to glory, and we don't want to be here no longer than we need to be here because heaven is, Paul said, I saw things. He said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But laying down, sometimes just prostrating. Somebody say the word prostrating. That's, that is, now, if you were in trouble with the king and you needed the king, to, or not just trouble, but maybe you were in trouble and needed the king. You would run into the throne room and you would literally prostrate yourself so that that king would know. Hey, this person means business. What is going on here? And sometimes when we prostrate ourselves down and say, Oh God, I need you. He hears. Does it mean he can't hear me standing up or bowing down? Sure he can. But sometimes it means more to us when we lay before him. And sometimes you're flat on your back. You ever been flat on your back? You know, sometimes we get flat on our back, figuratively speaking. The good thing about being flat on your back is there's only one direction, is looking up. Amen? Another posture of prayer is number five, standing or walking. Standing. I put standing or walking together because I'm talking about being on your two feet. Uh, let me just rehearse what I've been over so people just came in. I'm talking about postures of prayer, physical postures. I've talked about bowing your head. I talked about kneeling on your knees. I've talked about falling on your face or lying down. And I also want to talk to you about praying by standing. Uh, First Kings chapter eight and 22, it says, and Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel. So you can actually pray standing up. You don't have to be sitting down. You don't have to be bowing. You don't have to be kneeling. But standing, praying, is a biblical way to pray. That is a, one of the postures of prayer or walking. You know, there, there are movements in America, uh, and I did this um, uh, when I was pastoring in Kinston. We would actually do a prayer walk through the community. What did you do? So we would just take a street and I'd, I'd assign somebody to this street for this block. This Because our church then was in a uh, city block. Uh, we're not so much in the city block here at Tillman Road. But uh, but I'd say you walk down to this curb and you walk down to that curb. And what you do is when you're walking, every house there, you pray for the people in that house. You just pray. You don't knock on the door. You just pray. That's called a prayer walk. And and that's, a, that's not a bad thing. And, and, and you know, do you believe that if, you, if we walked through uh, several blocks and just prayed and prayed in the spirit and prayed with faith, uh, that's kind of like, that's kind of like the, the, the Air Force dropping the bombs before they invade on D-Day, right? It just prepares the way. Amen. And so prayer walking. Uh, sometimes, to be honest with you, you need to stand up and pray because if you sit down or you lay down, you're going to fall asleep. Some of you on medication. And so for you standing and praying or walking and praying and, and uh, sometimes in my living room or in, in the house, I'll walk uh, back and forth while I'm praying just to focus my prayers. Uh, sometimes on our Friday night prayer meeting, uh, some of you will be kneeling. Some have even laid. Uh, some are walking around. Is there anything wrong with any of that? No, all of it's acceptable and all of it's needed. Uh, and it, it, it just keeps you... Uh, focused a little differently. Amen. 
So standing, walking, laying down, falling on your face. Number six, looking up with open eyes. Psalm 5 and 3 says, My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, and in the morning will I direct my prayer to you, and will what? You don't have to have your eyes closed when you pray. I wear contact lenses. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I wore like glasses when I, you know, I, I, when I was 15, I, I needed glasses. And so you see my sophomore year, my freshman year, it's my sophomore, junior, and senior year pictures all have glasses. Um, but when I was 18, my mama let me go to the eye care center in Terrytown Mall in Rocky Mount, the old Terrytown Mall. And I said, Mama, I want, because when, when I'm out at the football game with those glasses, I see glares. I can never get those glasses clean. I cannot keep a glasses clean. There's always a spot, always a speck on it. I'm constantly, and plus it wears my face out. Wearing glasses kind of wears me out. You know, uh, after a day, I take them off. It's like, whew, you know, I feel like I'm afraid. It's just weird. If those of you don't know what I'm talking about, you never wore glasses. But, uh, and I'll never forget when they told me to, and, and so I said, I'm going to get contact lenses. And I remember the first, first time I got fitted for contact and that little bitty contact on the end of my finger and I would sit down it took me 30 minutes to convince my eye to let let it happen that was eye number one then I had eye number two and now you throw me a contact lens I can pop it in buddy it's ain't nothing I can do it driving I don't have to have any I can put that contact lens in and thank the Lord for contact lenses praise God I can see so clear in the morning when I first get up and I wash my hair and everything and I put in those contacts and everything uh, sharpens to focus i'm like praise god i can see again amen i don't sleep with my contacts now some people can but i don't i said all that to say this when i close my eyes for a length of time my contacts will begin to dry out so i do have to pray with my eyes open but but some of you need to pray with your eyes open uh in order to stay awake in order to focus your prayers uh, in order to look up to god our hands are do that right now your hands are lifted up and you're looking unto god the bible says him that those that look for him shall he appear and then finally uh posture number seven is lifting up and spreading forth holy hands look at first timothy two and eight and we're getting ready to do some postures here first timothy two and eight it says this, uh, uh, that we are, uh, I will therefore that men are pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Come on, lift those hands up and pray and talk to the Lord. Uh, look up. Uh, he is working. Uh, call, uh, call upon the Lord. Uh, bow before him. Kneel before him. Lay before him. Fall on your face. Uh, there's so many ways to pray that your prayers don't have to be stagnant and stale and boring. Your prayers can be effective and powerful. What posture are you going to pray with tomorrow? Are you going to kneel tomorrow? That's good. Are you going to pray with your eyes open and your hands lifted? That's good. Nothing's wrong. All of it's right. Just do what's in your heart and just make sure your prayer doesn't fizzle out and you do the same prayer, the same thing every day. No effectiveness. It don't even move you, How, let alone is it going to move God or scare the devil. Amen. You want to scare the devil one good time? You walk around your house all by this sometimes all by myself, but only the cat. And I'll get around there and I'll stomp around and say, "Devil, you're not having my family. You're not." See, you just gotta. This is just more than lay me down to sleep prayers. Amen. You just gotta have some different ways and different avenues and different approaches to prayer. I close by telling you, I can't read it. It's too long. But there's a book called The Circle Maker, written by Mark Batterson. Chapter 1, it goes back to the history of Israel, not biblical history. It's not recorded in the Bible. But it was another drought. I started tonight talking about the drought in Elijah's time. But this was around the first century B.C., before Christ. And there's a legend of a man by the name of, uh, I see it up here. His name is H-O-N-I. I guess you call it Honey. And they said that it was not, it had not rained. They were, in, they were in a desperate need. But they knew this man, Honey, H-O-N-I. They knew he could get a hold of God. And they called him. And he began to draw a circle. 
and he drew a circle around himself. And it's recorded in history that he called out to the God of heaven and said, Oh God, sin reign. We are desperate. Lord of the universe, I swear before your great name that I will not move from this circle until you have shown mercy upon your children. The word sent a shudder down the spines of all those who were in earshot that day. It wasn't just the volume of his voice. It was the authority of his tone. Not a hint of doubt. This prayer didn't originate in the vocal cords. Like water from an artesian well, the words flowed from the depth of his soul. He said, I will not leave this circle until you have sent rain. And then it happened. As his prayer ascended to the heavens, drip, drip, raindrops began to descend to the earth. An audible gasp swept across the thousands of congregants who had encircled Honey. Every head turned heavenward as the first raindrops parachuted from the sky. But his head remained bowed. The people rejoiced over each drop, but he wasn't satisfied with a sprinkle. Still kneeling within the circle, he lifted up his voice over the sounds of the celebration. Not for such rain have I prayed, but for rain that will fill cisterns and pits and caverns. And sure enough, the sprinkle turned into such a torrential downpour that eyewitnesses said no raindrop was smaller than an egg in size. It rained so heavy and steadily that the people fled to the temple mount to escape the flash floods. Yet Honey stayed in his prayer circle and uh, once more he refined his bold request. Not for such rain have I prayed, but the rain of your favor, blessing and graciousness. Then like a well-proportioned sun shower on a hot and humid August afternoon, it began to rain calmly and peacefully. Each raindrop was a tangible token of God's grace. And it didn't just soak the skin, it soaked the spirit of faith. Eventually, the dirt turned into mud and back into dirt again. After quenching their thirst, the crowd disappeared. The rainmaker returned to his hum humble home, and life returned to normal. But the legend of the circle maker had been born. The prayer that saved the generation was deemed one of the most significant prayers in the history of Israel. The circle he drew in the sand became a sacred symbol. And the legend of Ho Honey, the circle maker, that's his name, H-O-N-I, the circle maker stands forever as a testament to the power of a single prayer to change the course of history. Would you stand with me tonight? What's going to be your prayer posture? Pastor Jerry's coming. What are you going to do right now? Will you, some of you want to lift your hands, do that. Some of you want to bow your heads, do that. Maybe some of you need to go home and draw a prayer circle somewhere around and say, I'm not leaving this circle until my children get saved, until my husband comes home. And maybe you have to leave that circle literally to go to work, but you can figuratively and spiritually and symbolically build a circle around and say, God, here, we need a rain from heaven. We need an outpouring of your grace. It's a dry and a thirsty land. And oh God, we're, we're the church of them. We're going to posture ourselves and watch you move as you respond to the prayers of your people. Would you give him a hand of praise here tonight? Amen. 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 There are so many ways we can pray. And I will never forget, I had an incident in my life that most of the time I don't kneel to pray. I, I do a lot of different postures. But an incident happened, and I said, the Lord spoke to me. I was in a service. I was shouting and dancing and praising God. And the preacher in the middle of his sermon said, don't what, do what you're fixing to do. If you do, you're going to mess it up where God can't fix it. Well, I know he ain't talking to me. He's talking to somebody else. I'm full of God, rejoicing, dancing. The well, next day, I made one phone call. And that phone call went wrong. And it would alter my entire future had I missed God. My wife, Teresa... I had made my mind up. She was dating someone else and going to church with me. And I had, my ego had taken it about as long as it could. And I had decided the day before, I'm going to tell her to make up her mind one way or the other. That was my ego. 
And I called her the next morning. We always go to church on Sunday morning and Sunday night. And I said, I'll be able to get you shortly to go to church. She said, I'm going to church with you this morning, but I'm not going back tonight. I said, we always go Sunday morning, Sunday night. Well, I'm going to Raleigh. Well, I knew who was in Raleigh. He was the other fella. <laughs> I said, why don't you make up your mind what you're going to do? She said, Jerry, I'm not going to church with you today. I said, I got to go. I, I'll call you back. And God spoke to me. And God said, it was you I was speaking to last night. And when he said that, I dropped down like this. And I think I might have gone on down like this. <laughs> I said, that's the Eastern culture way of praying. Oh, God, I'm so sorry. Please, God, forgive me. If you'll fix this thing, God, I promise you, I'll try to never get ahead of you again. There have been many incidences in my life. And I've had to go back to that moment and say, God, I want to make this thing the right decision. I don't want to get ahead of what you're doing. You know, a lot of times it's just timing. But all these postures of prayer are so important. But I knew that day that my normal posture of prayer had to be altered. And, you know, I think the Spirit leads us yes. in all of these. Whatever the impression of the Holy Spirit is, if you will just follow that. And I'll leave you with one last one. Can I yes. add one to it? Yes, sir. Amen. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. sitting. The posture of prayer was sitting. Amen. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke with other tongues as the Spirit gave them others. I think about all of these ways that we can yes. pray. Yes. And then I go back to Dr. Lester Sumrall. Yes. He said the most important thing about prayer, yes. and we've been looking at the kaleidoscope of prayer, and we're looking at all the different avenues. The most important thing about prayer is what? Do it. Do it. Just do it. Just do it. And because God hears a whisper. Yes, he does. God knows the thought and intent of our heart. And he's just waiting for us. Father, we love you and praise you. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for guidance, for wisdom, for knowledge, for understanding. Lord, knowledge is power. And Lord, we just praise you for revival. We thank you for the God factor in our life. Lord, we praise you for pouring out your spirit upon this place and giving us, Lord, what we are prayed for, what we continue to pray for, for your presence, for your anointing. And the church said in Jesus' name, amen. Look at three people and tell them, you are blessed and highly favored of God. You are blessed and highly favored of God. You are blessed, blessed, blessed and highly favored of God.